Can epigenetic age be reduced within an eight-week study? That's what this study, which was published a few months ago, sought to figure out. So first, uh, how many, what was the study cohort? How many participants and how old were they? Uh, so this was a relatively small study uh, that included 38 men. Unfortunately, women were not included. So whether these uh, effects apply to women uh, or only men are unknown. And uh, the subjects had an average age of 59 years. So also whether these results are gener generalizable to younger subjects or older subjects, also un unknown. Uh, now note that this is a uh, potential reversal of epigenetic age using a diet and lifestyle intervention. So what was recommended? And, and they recommended a lot of things. So it's important to go through each of them to see what they were trying to do and how they were trying to do it. And then to look at uh, what they actually found in terms of epigenetic age. So uh, this was their dietary prescription and this was their uh, recommended guidance per day. So daily intake and they recommended uh, a decent amount of vegetables. As you can see, two cups per day of dark leafy greens, including kale, Swiss chard, collard, spinach, etc. Two cups of cruci cruciferous vegetables, so broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and all of the rest of the uh, cruciferous vegetable family. And then three additional cups per day of colorful vegetables, but not starchy vegetables like white potatoes or corn. One to two medium beets per day. And then they also included some seeds uh, or recommended uh, seed intake. Uh, so uh, cumulatively, the seeds uh, is about, this is about 60 grams per day or about 400 calories of pumpkin and sunflower seeds. And then this was not a vegan or vegetarian diet as they recommended eight ounces of animal protein per day, including grass-fed, uh, pastured, organic, and hormone and antibiotic-free meat. And then they recommended two servings per day of low glycemic fruit, cherries, apples, pears, etc. But that wasn't all for the dietary recommendations. They also recommended a one plus serving per day of what they called were methylation adaptogens. So foods or drinks that uh, have been shown to affect uh, methylation, DNA methylation. And these uh, uh, recommendations included half a cup per day of berries, rosemary, turmeric, uh, uh, cloves of garlic, uh, two cups per day uh, of, of green tea, which would count as one serving uh, per day, or three cups of oolong tea. Uh, so they only recommended one plus serving, so it would be one uh, uh, food or drink item from this list uh, that would be an actual intake potentially. All right, and then in terms of the diet going further, they also off offered guidance per week, so weekly guidance, uh, and they uh, recommended three servings of liver with one serving, serving being three ounces of liver, uh, of liver. so uh, about nine ounces of liver was recommended per week, and then five to ten eggs per week. But they actually, their prescription, the recommendations actually went way beyond this too. So let's go uh, a little bit further. So the, their general guidance was to uh, consume organic foods over conventional uh, pesticide-laden uh, foods and to stay hydrated, uh, so to drink enough water. And then they recommended a, you know, some version of time-restricted feeding, so not eating between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. And then they recommended uh, including quote-unquote healthy oils and they said to balance types of fat. And if you notice their list here, coconut, olive, flaxseed, and pumpkin seed oil, these are fats representative of different uh, types of fatty acids. For example, coconut is almost exclusively saturated fatty acids. Olive is uh, mostly monounsaturated fatty acids. Flaxseed is mostly omega-3 polyunsaturated. And pumpkin seed oil is mostly omega-6 polyunsaturated. And then they recommended avoiding sugar and candy, and then dairy grains, also dairy grains and legumes. So one could argue this is some version of a modified paleo diet, including meat, vegetables, some fruit, and some seeds, but not uh, obviously any sugar or candy, dairy grains, or legumes. And, and then they also recommended to minimize plastic food containers uh, or use of that. Now, the, the recommendations didn't stop there. Uh, they also uh, uh, provided uh, study, uh, study participants in the treatment group with a supplement that uh, was a combination of dried uh, vegetables, fruits, seeds, herbs, and other stuff which they consider to be prebiotics, which encouraged the growth of quote unquote beneficial bacteria in the intestine. And then they also supplemented with uh, probiotics, including uh, Lactobacillus plantarum. And the reason they included this uh, uh, bacterium is because it's been shown to increase folate synthesis uh, and because folate's involved in the methylation cycle, one could argue that having a higher folate intake could result in a younger epigenetic age. They also recommended uh, exercise, and obviously these aren't anything outrageous, but they recommended 30 minutes per day, five days per week, which are pretty close to the standard recommendations. And then they also offered sleep prescription and stress management prescriptions, including 
uh, getting an average of seven hours of sleep per night and uh, uh, performing breathing exercises. And their rationale for this was, if you're, was, it was that if you are sleep deprived or you have chronic stress, that this could result in an older epigenetic age. So by getting enough uh, sleep and reducing stress, that they could potentially reduce their uh, epigenetic age within the study timeline. Now, as you can see, they recommended a lot of diet and lifestyle changes. So we should expect to see a very large decrease, or at least that was the hope for epigenetic age. So what did they find? So here are the main study results. And uh, first, it's important to note that we're looking uh, on the y-axis at epigenetic age uh, for the change versus baseline. Now, an interesting uh, uh, question arises then, which epigenetic clock was used to quantify epigenetic age? That's important because if you're not using a good metric to study this, then how reliable are your results? So which clock did they use? So it's important to note that all epigenetic clocks are not the same for their correlation with chronological age. So in this study, and I've uh, reviewed this study in an earlier video, if you're interested in, in uh, learning about the results from that study, you can click on the video in the right corner for more details about the, uh, this compar comparative study of 11 epigenetic clocks. So uh, this is the correlation for each of these 11 epigenetic clocks with a multitude of different cell types in uh, blood. And that is in the right corner, you know, including uh, cells from the breast, cheek, cerebellum, so brain, colon, cord blood, et cetera. In other words, which epigenetic clock was uh, the best for uh, the compositive, the compositive, uh, the full cumulate, uh, uh, the full amount of these different cell types? Which epigenetic test was the best for their correlation with chronological age across all of the cell types? So uh, what we can see by looking at the correlation, so COR and the p-value, uh, so the, the two that had the strongest correlation, and in fact, uh, a correlation uh, as close to one or negative one is as good as it gets. So in this case, we're looking for uh, as close to one, but not negative one. We want uh, you know older epigenetic age to be associated with older uh, chronological ages and vice versa. So in this case, we can see the two strongest correlations, 0 0.94 and 0 0.85, as I've rectangled, are Horvath, Steve Horvath's epigenetic clock. You can see if you take a look at the correlations and, uh, and the p-values for the other nine epigenetic clocks, they're nowhere near as close or not as close uh, as Horvath's clocks for uh, their correlation with chronological age. So uh, this isn't the only study that's shown this. Uh, Steve Horvath's epigenetic clock is consistently the best for its correlation with chronological age. So, okay, that's a good sign. They used the, the Horvath epi epigenetic clock for their, for their analysis. Now, well, now that we know that, what did they find? So first, when looking at the difference from baseline to the end of the study eight weeks later, the controls had a 1.27 older epigenetic age, but this wasn't a statistically significant difference from baseline. And you can see based on the p-value 0.15, p-value is greater than 0.05 are not statistically significant. So what about the treatment group, the one that uh, uh, was exposed to this large diet plus uh, lifestyle uh, uh, intervention, or at least recommended to have a large diet plus lifestyle intervention. And, and we can see the treatment group, so comparing, again, baseline versus eight weeks later, uh, experienced a 1.96 year younger epigenetic age when compared with baseline. But note that the p-value is just outside of the 0 0.05 cutoff, 0 0.66. So uh, it's important to note that, you know, the change that the treatment group uh, saw was close to statistical significance, but not statistically significant. So uh, how was uh, statistical significance uh, 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 obtained? And that was when uh, obtained when comparing between group data. So when uh, comparing the, the changes for the treatment group versus the changes with controls for both groups combined, we can see that now overall there was a 32 uh, 3.23 year younger epigenetic age for the treatment group when compared with controls, and now the p-value is statistically significant. So uh, that's, oh, that's uh, good that it shows that there was a treatment effect, between group treatment effect, but let's look a little bit deeper at this data. So it's important to note that epigenetic age was improved for only 44% of the treatment group. So let's have a look at that data. So here we can see on the x-axis, DNA M age, so epigenetic age, measured at the beginning of the study, so before any potential interventions. And again, this is only the data for the treatment group, versus on the y-axis, the uh, epigenetic age measured at the end of the study. So first, what we can see is that there was a younger 
uh, epigenetic age at the end of the study when compared with the beginning of the study for only eight of the 18 subjects in the treatment group as indicated by the black arrows. However, uh, there was an unchanged uh, epigenetic age, DNAM age, at the end of the study when compared with the beginning for exactly half of the studies in that group. And actually, one of the 18 subjects experienced an older epigenetic age in the treatment group when compared with the beginning of the study. So it's important to note that there was no change or worse that one subject epigenetic age for more than half of the participants in the, in the, in the treatment group. So this was promoted as a diet and lifestyle intervention and in fact a big a massive diet and lifestyle intervention. But what did they actually eat? How much or how often did they actually exercise, take the supplement, practice the breathing exercises and all of the other stuff that was on the list? So I raised that issue because in the studies and inclusion criteria, so these are the criteria that are required to be agreed upon by the study participants in order for them to be included into the study. We can see that one of those inclusion criteria was being uh, willing to track food intake, sleep, stress management techniques, and exercise daily. So that data should exist. However, it wasn't published. So it's impossible to say if any parts of this intervention were actually different from baseline. And moreover, because that data wasn't reported in the study, it's uh, unclear if there was actually a difference for any of that, the, the diet plus, plus lifestyle intervention from baseline. So it's unclear how much the intervention actually affected uh, epigenetic age. So with that in mind, was the about two year difference in epi epigenetic age reduction in, only in the treatment group a real effect that was caused by this intervention or statistical noise? So uh, that's all for that for that study. I just wanted to throw in a quick ad that I'm now on Patreon. So uh, for those who want to learn more about my biohacking pursuits, even though I didn't show it in this video, but upcoming videos, I'm going to get back to that. Uh, I'm going to post exclusive uh, information that I don't post anywhere else on none of my social media sites, including my daily data for rest, uh, resting heart rate, heart rate variability, and sleep stages and then my daily intake for food and macro and micronutrients. So you can follow along with how my daily progress goes for both of those variables. And then early sneak peeks and spoilers for new videos. Uh, yesterday I posted some of the slides from this video right here and a lot more. So if you're interested in that, check it out. And uh, again, once again, uh, that's all for now. Uh, if you made it to the end, thanks for watching and you can find me a, a lot of places online. Have a great day.